And so, so, so just as a general comment getting into this, um, in, in terms of the big picture for medical oncologists as, as uh, um, uh, medical experts who work in a multidisciplinary practices and taking care of a lot of head and neck cancer patients, still by and large, oral cavity disease, the first question becomes, is this, can we approach this surgically? And, and I'm going to get to that in our further discussion, but, but that is a fundamental approach that's taken at most centers, not, not, not all, even for patients who have uh, node-positive disease. And, and the question of, inv of induction chemotherapy, for example, certainly remains investigational in this subgroup. Now, you just heard an entire session on uh, HPV oral pharyngeal disease, and the change in our centers is absolutely striking. It wasn't very long ago that base of tongue cancer, T2, T3 base of tongue cancer, was a bad tumor, aggressive, and had to be very cautious when it was tobacco associated. And the picture has changed with HPV as, as just uh, you heard. In the, in the larynx, um, you know, the focus of our study um, has been to cure these cancers, of course, whether we're taking a primarily surgical approach or primarily a radiation approach for patients who have disease that's, that's uh, uh, within the primary tumor area and the region. But, but also, of course, organ preservation is very important for patients who have larynx cancer. And so our, our session here is timely because we've just seen published only in the last week or so some long-term follow-up studies looking at chemo radiation, and so I think it's perfect. It's perfect timing to go through some of these data. Now, with, from the medical oncologist's perspective, we know, unlike squamous cell carcinomas of the oral tongue or floor of mouth, the squamous cancers of the larynx are very sensitive to chemotherapy, and there's no doubt that we can induce remissions. But the question becomes. Um, how best do you treat these patients for long-term disease control and, and function? And so there have been important studies. The Gore-Tex study was published um, some years ago showing that there may be advantages with TPF, with the addition of a taxane to cisplatin uh, 5-FU in terms of overall preservation. But what's exciting today is that the long-term RTOG data are, are now available for us to review and, and criticize. Now in this study, which, I, and I'd remind you, this study was conducted in the 90s. And so chemotherapy was a little different. We're using platin 5-FU. Um, radiation therapy techniques were certainly different. And you know, IMRT, it, it was not around at that time, at least in terms of common practice. Now in this study, the comparator arm, the baseline arm, was induction cisplatin 5-FU followed by radiotherapy. For patients largely with intermediate stage disease, i.e. T2 and 1, T3 and 0, T3 and 1, patients with bulky T4 disease were excluded in this study. And so for you practitioners who may not see a lot of head and neck cancer, that has to be kept in mind that the patients we're talking about as we go through these data did not have large destructive T4 tumors. Um, even though all of us, you know, in this setting would, would like to be able to preserve the larynx. Um, the comparator arms were, were concomitant radiation with platinum or radiation alone, and in all arms, surgical salvage was an option for patients with persistent or recurrent disease. Now, um, let me see. Five-year data were presented uh, by Arlene Forestier at the ASCO in 06 or so. And, and they're shown here. And, and a couple of comments I'd, I'd make would be, number one, when you're giving RT alone, you're going to tend to be more successful in getting the radiation into these patients. Um, because whenever you do sequential treatment, there's always some fall off. And we saw it before, and we're still seeing it. In, in terms of larynx preservation, the early returns, and they still are when we get to the 10-year data, that concomitant therapy appeared to be superior. But laryngectomy-free survival, very similar between the induction, the sequential treatment arm with induction followed by radiation to concomitant therapy. And I think this we have to keep in mind as we, as we look to the future about what's best for these patients. Now, 10-year data just, just published a week ago are, are, are shown here. 
And, and the first slide uh, shows the difference between concomitant therapy and the other approaches, radiation alone or radiation followed by induction. And there's, a, there's clearly an advantage for concomitant therapy, but you do have to keep in mind that patients who died were censored, and so they didn't represent fall off in this comparison. And in fact, um, laryngectomy free survival was not statistically different between the induction arm and the concomitant arm. It even trended in favor of, of induction. Overall survival shown on this uh, lower graph is not different between the two arms. In the Tremplin study, uh, which is also just recently reported, this is a phase two study from Europe in which for the first time induction therapy, this time with TPF, so with a taxane, docetaxel, uh, and platin 5-FU, was administered to patients with larynx and hypopharynx cancer, locally advanced disease. And then after the response assessment, those patients who were responding were randomized to radiation with concomitant cisplatin or radiation with cetuximab. So, so this represented something new, actually, in prospective randomized trials in larynx cancer because we had chemo radiation following induction. So it's asking the question about not only which one is better, is there a survival advantage, is there a control advantage in terms of tumor, but are, are these feasible? And, and it turned out that with, with long-term follow-up that, that larynx preservation was probably the same um, with the chemo radiation with high doses platin versus concomitant Herbitux, cetuximab, and radiotherapy. Patients who went on after the induction, though, to get cetuximab therapy with radiation were more likely not to have uh, breaks in therapy, were more likely to complete the planned treatment program. And so that's something to keep in mind. And what it's suggesting from the get-go as you start to review this paper is that induction chemotherapy followed by concomitant chemoradiation it's tough to give, and it's certainly tough to take. Now, in this particular study, um, there was an approximate 25% uh, dropout for those patients getting induction chemotherapy. And these, in many regards, are the, these are the patients who are most concerned about, the ones who are not doing so well, the ones whose tumors are resistant. So we have to, we have to stay critical with that. If you look back at this randomization, I'm saying 76% of patients um, went, to, went to PR and randomization. Well, actually, the percentage of responders was a little higher than that. The percentage of responders to TPF was about 82%. But there were about 10 patients who fell off because of drug toxicity, because they just gave up, uh, be, you know, because one patient was not eligible. I mean, there were a variety of reasons. And so the, the point being that that um, induction chemotherapy followed by, chemo t uh, by concomitant chemoradiation is tough to give. Now, now in this study, um, laryngeal-free survival um, or, or local regional uh, tumor recurrence was a little higher in, in the cetuximab arm. Um, overall performance was about the same in, in both arms. These were not statistically significant differences. But clearly, acute toxicity in the patients receiving cisplatin was higher. And the conclusion of the authors was that more study is needed. We need to probably take a little different approach than this one, or at least it wasn't clear that this is ideal. And so this slide kind of summarizes this for larynx, that, that while treatment goals are lofty and they're well known uh, to you as an audience, Concomitant cisplatin and radiation therapy remains the established paradigm for intermediate stage disease, intermediate stage larynx cancer, and, and selected T4 disease. But, but for deeply invasive T4 tumor surgery remains, initial surgery probably followed by radiation in many cases remains the treatment of choice. Induction chemotherapy <clears throat> is a preferred approach in some parts of the world, in Europe actually. Um, and, and certainly the, the data from the RTOG study where uh, in terms of overall outcome and a suggestion of a survival advantage after induction chemotherapy are, are very interesting. Um, but, but this approach in the U.S. is still considered to be an experimental approach, although clearly it is an option in treating patients with larynx cancer based on the RTOG data. The focus of, of current research is to develop better markers to, to identify 
uh, which direction patients should go in. Now, as, as we think about squamous cancer of, of in, in more general terms um, in the head and neck, the meta-analysis data are pretty clear that, that there is an advantage with induction chemotherapy in terms of reducing risk of distant re uh, disease recurrence, and there's an advantage with concomitant therapy to increase local tumor control uh, after chemoradiation. Whenever we're evaluating these regimens, you, you have to get used to looking not at the individual components, but at the whole process, because almost no matter what you do here, it's going to affect what you're able to do here, uh, in a, as it did in the Tremplin study. Um, what has been a move ahead, but published now uh, six, seven years ago, has, has been the addition of of taxane to cisplatin 5-FU. We've come to recognize in, in, in uh, phase two trials and prospective comparative trials that there is an advantage in terms of overall outcome, in terms of response rates, and in terms of overall outcome with using induction chemotherapy with TPF followed by radiation with carboplatin as in the 324 study or radiation alone as in the Vermorkin uh, reported study from Europe. So, so this has become accepted. What's not become accepted, however, um, is that there is an overall survival advantage to using induction therapy even for patients with stage four disease. And so this has led to prospective randomized trials that have been presented, one of which is just recently published and the other one uh, probably about to be submitted uh, in Boston, that study conducted by Rob Haddad, our, our previous speaker, and from Chicago, from Ezra Cohen. Now, now let's look at these prospective randomized trials, because this is a question that comes to you in your office when you have a patient who comes in with regionally advanced disease. We've been doing induction chemotherapy for a long time, but do we think about it for this individual patient? Now, in the DECIDE uh, trial, and you can see the format um, uh, presented here, and, and, and Ezra had presented these data at the ESCO meeting of last year. Patients with N2 or N3 disease were eligible, good performance level patients. They were randomized to TPF versus the Chicago style intensive concomitant chemoradiation schedule, DFHX, in which patients would receive concomitant chemotherapy and radiation given twice daily in an alternate week sequence. Um, and Weichselbaum and Volks have published this over the years, and so you can, you can look at their, at, at their papers to review exactly how this is done. But the randomization was straightforward. You got the induction chemotherapy given for two cycles and on to, to chemoradiation or to chemoradiation. Um, the uh, distribution of patients by treatment arm uh, was equal. I would keep in mind, as you're looking at head and neck studies as, as a general practitioner, uh, oncologist practitioner, that the age of patients who go into these studies tends to be young, usually in the range of 55, 56, 57, same as here. Many of the patients who went into this study, and also the Haddad study, had oropharynx cancer because they come in, they're, they're relatively young, they're in generally good health, they have nodal involvement often at times at time of presentation. They were just right for these studies, and so they made up about half the patients in, in both of these trials. The quality assurance in, in the DECIDE trial was excellent. Patients, it was and certainly comparable between the, the two groups. Patients had good quality radiotherapy. It turned out, with regard to the chemotherapy arm, that is the patients who received induction chemotherapy in the DECIDE trial, then went on to chemoradiation, they did have more bone marrow toxicity during chemoradiation than the other arm. It was the only real difference in terms of important grade three and grade four toxicity. Not too surprising for practitioners like yourselves that you anticipate not only acute toxicity, but, but some compromise in the ability to, to uh, tolerate chemoradiation, and that, and that did obtain in this study. Um, overall survival in the DECIDE trial, no bacon here. They're just, uh, these, these curves are just right on top of each other. As there was careful retrospective subset analysis, there was some suggestion that more patients died of cancer um, who, who were not in the induction arm, but it was not a statistically significant difference. There was also a suggestion that the patients most likely to benefit who were in this trial had 
bilateral or very bulky neck disease, but again, it was not a statistically significant difference in outcome, only a suggestion that we could use that to select patients. In the Paradigm trial that Rob Haddad had um, uh, been the PI for, there was a little different setup in terms of how patients went into the trial. There was a randomization between induction or not using radiotherapy um, with concomitant boost and, con and, and cisplatin as the control arm. But patients who went into the, into the experimental arm getting induction chemotherapy had local therapy dependent upon the response. So the chemo radiation was different in the two arms, and even in the experimental arm, depending on your response, it could be different. So those patients who didn't respond well to chemotherapy had concomitant uh, docetaxel and, and MD Anderson-style concomitant boost radiotherapy. Those who responded well to the induction had weekly carboplatin. So, so this study, by some, was criticized for the format. My personal view of it was that given that it was conducted about the same time as the Chicago study, where there was a straight randomization, the data here are very interesting. Plus, this is more likely to happen in the real world, where doctors who are taking care of these patients are influenced by what happens with the initial exposure. At any rate, um, the uh, arms were comparable. Again, young patients, 55 years old. Uh, oropharynx was the primary site, the most common primary site, um, but there was, uh, the, the, the results were disappointingly uh, negative. Both studies were compromised by a poor accrual. That was even worse in the Paradigm study. Only 140 patients were entered. Patterns of failure in the Paradigm study, it doesn't matter which arm is A or B, they're just virtually identical. And so, so the, the world of head and neck cancer has changed in the last 20 years. I mean, from, uh, it's gone a long way from uh, when I was first in it a long time ago with George Sisson in Chicago. And in this slide, you're all aware of, but I think it's, it's a very interesting slide of, uh, of tobacco use in the United States. And it, and it shows, you know, back a century and a half ago, cigarette smoking, very unusual, but it became extraordinarily common after World War II, and now it's, it's quite dropping off. In fact, tobacco use in general is dropping off, and that probably explains why there's such a difference in terms of the populations in our lung cancer clinic and our head and neck cancer clinic. The only group that sort of held on over the years has been that small group that, that uh, dips snuff, and, but, that's, but that's not very many. Um, you've seen this, these data on the previous slide. Oropharynx, uh, HPV positive disease, uh, is becoming increasingly the common disease that we see in the squamous cell carcinoma subgroup of patients. And so our, so our staging now, as we think about these patients, we take into account site, nodal involvement, we take into account where the nodes are involved, whether we're looking at nodes involved on both sides of the neck or if they're low in the neck, and, and HPV and smoking status, as you just heard. Now, <clears throat> Rob referred to these data, but he didn't show this graph. Now, keep in mind that these are patients in a cooperative group. That is, that is to say, RTOG is an excellent group, but every doctor isn't the best doctor in the world in the entire group. And these are all patients who have stage three and stage four squamous cancer of the head and neck. And if you're in that low risk group, look how well you do. And, and so it's, it's really striking how, you know, this is really a different group than, than this group here. And it, th therapy was, you know, certainly high quality, but still the outcomes here are very impressive. And so we really do need to take that information into account. And so what are we trying to do medically to, Im to improve our therapy? I, I, I can say that in our center, you know, we have 40 phase one trials going on at any one time, but in head and neck cancer, in part because of the very favorable results obtaining in many patients and are depending on surgery for oral cavity patients, um, you know, we still often are using cetuximab as, our, as the main targeted principle in treating squamous cancers of the head and neck. <clears throat> the cetuximab and the EGFR inhibitor experience is summarized on this slide. Um, certainly, we've demonstrated single agent activity but the benefit for patients seems to be greater when cetuximab is combined with chemotherapy as published by Vermorkin or radiotherapy published uh, by Bonner. 
And, and this issue is cetuximab and HPV um, interaction is something that you should look for because more and more we're starting to f see evidence uh, that the HPV positive subgroup is not benefited by the addition of cetuximab as are the other groups. So Dr. Uh, Ang um, at uh, the ASCO last year um, published RTOG work that was exploring the question of whether cetuximab, an active EGFR inhibitory principle, and certainly has made a contribution to the care of patients with head and neck cancer, would make a difference uh, as an addition to chemo radiation. And, and there was no clear evidence uh, of, of benefit, as shown here. And so, <clears throat> so a conclusion with regard to that in treating locally advanced disease is that adding cetuximab to radiation cisplatin is not clearly better, at least for the patients who have been treated up to date. It did, it didn't, the, there, there did not seem to be a differential effect, and I didn't show the data, but for HPV positivity uh, or negativity. Um, with the addition of cetuximab, there wasn't a clear increase in long-term toxicity. That's a favorable result. And probably what's called for is more of a trial that matches radiation therapy with cetuximab versus radiation therapy with cisplatin. And a similar study with banatumumab has been conducted in Canada, and we're waiting to hear results. Of interest, in patients who have metastatic or recurrent uh, disease, the spectrum data uh, presented by Vermorkin and, and other colleagues over the last year or so in, in Europe and the United States again asked this question about whether there is an advantage to adding an EGFR inhibitor, in this case penetumumab, to conventional chemotherapy for patients with recurrent or widely metastatic disease. And so, and conducted a randomized trial, but, but also looking at the question of HPV positivity. And, and the, the interesting early result from this trial is that the benefit seems to be most clearly consistent with some earlier suggested comments I made. The benefit appears to be most clearly um, uh, obvious in the HPV negative group. And this is just the group that we're trying to focus on more in terms of advancing our therapy because it's the subgroup is just not doing so well. So you're going, to, you're going to hear more about these data, and, and there will be an attempt to, uh, to corroborate this initial observation with time. So EGFR inhibition in HPV uh, negative uh, cancer, was, it, it, it does appear to be an active principle, and, and as just stated, it's something that we're going to continue to pursue in our, in our trials. Now, <clears throat> at our center, uh, we have been interested in induction chemotherapy than modifying local therapy in, in a study environment, okay, in a, in a, in a trial. And we, we did publish some, a couple of years ago, a phase two trial in which the results looked very promising, and, most, and, and still are. And, and these data, uh, which will be published in Head and Neck, show an 89% long-term survival, minimum follow-up five years, in patients, all of whom had at least N2B nodal disease. After an induction regimen, I don't want to focus on the details with, with paclitaxel, uh, carboplatin, and cetuximab, followed by risk-based local therapy. And those patients who had small primary tumors had radiation alone, not radiation with chemotherapy, which would have been the practice. Using this approach, and retrospectively, we found that probably half of patients were HPV positive. The outcomes, not only in terms of disease control, but in terms of function, are really much more promising than the kind of, of, of data that, that you used to obtain in, in treating patients with advanced head and neck cancer. And, and you can see here that in this subgroup of patients with excellent survival, in the oropharyngeal subgroup, we actually only have one patient with chronic dysphagia, no patients um, with a G-tube in place. And so, and, and so this relates not just to the approach with induction chemotherapy and, and risk basing, but also it speaks to the, the improved efficacy and less hazard of current radiation approaches. So something to keep in mind as we, as we consider the old studies and we look to the future. I'm getting, and we're, and we're continuing to study this now, we're continuing to look at that fundamental approach, looking at different um, induction programs for patients who have advanced nodal disease. 
I'm getting the red light up here, so I'm going to move quickly. And I'd, 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 I'd uh, say that with regard to uh, chemoradiotherapy, that sequential treatment certainly has the potential to increase toxicity, and it obviously lengthens therapy. Concomitant chemoradiation for most locally advanced sites for stage 3 and stage 4 squamous cancer of the head and neck remains a non-surgical standard. And, and we support continuing to try to identify selection factors um, which will identify patients who are ideal uh, for a sequential study. <clears throat> As we see, induction chemotherapy is powerful, potentially effective, may have an effect on local disease control after definitive local therapy, and it gives us a vehicle to study new drugs and to see if, if, if we can target the areas that that uh, we identify as abnormal. And you, you know that squamous head and neck cancer, is, uh, the molecular changes are heterogeneous. Just, there isn't just one target to look at, and so we're, we're not at a, a, a point where we can do that yet. And so I'd, you know, I'd conclude with those comments that basically in our center, we consider eligible for sequential treatment patients who have advanced nodal disease, low neck disease, of course, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, we, we certainly agree with comments earlier that the HPV-positive patient should be studied with different questions asked um, in, in separate uh, endeavors. We're convinced that induction chemotherapy may affect local and distant disease control, but we have to prove it in our prospective trials. And as I just commented, that induction chemotherapy does represent an investigational vehicle to study new drug comments. So I'll conclude there. Thank you for being patient.